let's try it. <laughs> Good? Okay. Okay, welcome everyone. It's good to see you again. <laughs> um, you know, last month I, I went to America and I returned. And um, it was a wonderful time. <laughs> was so funny. <laughs> Anyways, I went back and I had a wonderful time with my family. Um, and it was a good time. Um, but one of the things that I'm noticing is um, America is changing a lot these days. It has been changing for a while, um, but I think it's becoming more apparent, the changes that are taking place. And a lot of the things that are happening is there's a lot of pressure being placed on the church. And there's a pressure from outside the church, but then also from within the church as well. And I think that a part of it is that the, the fact that the spiritual state of man um, is not known or correctly understood. I think that the, the political ideology that we have, especially in America and places where we really emphasize the rights of man, our freedom, um, or choice, um, and especially these days, acceptance of all things, of all groups, of all things. Um, this has really entered into our spiritual understanding as well. Uh, and it's gotten to the point where it's really overtaking what God's truth is. Uh, and it's, it's gotten to the point where man is redefining these things um, in God's word. So an example is, you know, just, just last month, a couple of weeks ago, um, the Presbyterian Church of America, um, they had a general assembly where the pastors gathered for the entire nation. And they had a vote on a, a special topic. And about 60 to 70% of the pastors for the general assembly, um, they agreed to allow pastors to start performing marriage ceremonies for gays and homosexuals. Um, what they found out was, you know, they couldn't really handle all the pressure they were getting, all the requests they were getting to perform these marriage ceremonies. Um, so what they did is they, they agreed, as, as a church, as an American church, um, the Presbyterian Church of America, and what they've gone and done is they had to redefine what marriage is. Um, in the past, in tradition, you know, um, according to the scriptures, according to what they believed in, there's a man and a woman getting married together. But now, the Presbyterian Church of America has redefined what marriage is as simply two people. And so what's happening is, is that the church is following the flow of culture. You know, the church is following you know, what society says. They really want to be accepted. And so they're changing. And it doesn't matter if it, if it goes against God's word in any way. And this is a crisis because not only... Um, you know, this, this decision is not only made for, you know, just one church, but all the churches in America that are attached to that den denomination. They all have to follow this. And so this is really uh, a difficult time in the church that we're entering into. But I think it's important to look at, you know, why are these kind of changes occurring in the church at all? You know, America has gone from a Christian nation to the most diverse religious culture in the world. Um, and, and a lot of the problem, I think, is pluralism, is entering into America. You know, all these religions, they're all becoming different paths and different ways um, that lead to God, that lead to salvation. And so why is this kind of thing happening? Um, if we look back kind of at history, we see that during the modern age, um, things were starting to change. And during the modern age, um, you know, mankind as a whole, the common people were giving more power. And you know the rights of people were stressed, and the choice was stressed, and this entered into the evangelical approach to sharing the gospel with people. Um, you know, instead of the biblical approach where people are chosen for salvation by God, it became the right of mankind to choose whether or not to accept God. You know, of course, this was natural because the modern age. You know, this was a reaction to a lot of the traditions and the authorities and the oppression that they had in the past. And it's all about placing more, hand, more power in the hands of humanity and the individual. So this is basically man kind of extending its power, almost like the Tower of Babel in the past. You know, where man wants to get an equal footing with God. We want to have the same power as God. And thus, you know, this is entering into the minds of men. You know, in the past, in, in about the 5th century, there was a man named Pelagius. And Pelagius, within the, the Christian framework, 
he believed that, you know, against tradition where we are born into sin, he believed that Adam and Eve's sin does not affect us at all. We are born spiritually neutral. So we are clean. You know, we can choose to live a perfect, righteous life if we want. Um, thus, we have perfect free will. Um, and it's about, it's all about our, our effort and, you know, through working hard to keep our moral, our moral rights, our, our moral standard, and to live perfectly holy lives. Um, but of course, this was denounced by the church, but what it did is it still was able to imprint into mankind this thinking. It kind of rooted in their thoughts. And so this kind of developed later on. It became semi-Pelagianism, which is kind of the same thing, except instead of man being perfectly free of any sin, they are kind of sick. They're just a little ill. Um, so if they try really hard, they can live a holy life. But they have this sickness that they have that needs to be healed. And this kind of went into Arminianism. And then what we have today is you know, Wesleyan Arminianism, which is basically what's sweeping America today. And it's basically, you know, um, it's kind of the same idea where man, it's all about man's choice to choose God. You know, man is given something called preventive grace. And this grace, it, it allows them to be spiritually awakened a little bit where they can either choose God or deny God. So they try to give some glory to God by saying, he shows everyone this grace. But it, the grace, it's the grace of God. But it still comes down to the individual's choice. And you have a choice to choose God. And you have a choice to deny God if you want. Um, and so what's happened is, you know, this has really entered into church culture and Christian culture. And, you know, these days, instead of trying to really look at the scriptures, we're kind of more focused on just trying to live as Christ lived. Look at him as a model. So we have the emerging church, which really stresses things like love and acceptance of all things. Um, the other thing that I want to look at is, you know, another thing that's happening is, Related to this is how we're trying to appeal to the desire of man. Now, first it was the choice of man, now it's the desire of man. And, you know, the evangelical group is really trying to do this, you know, trying to find out what man really wants and try to offer that to them in exchange for them accepting Christ or accepting the gospel. You know, finding out what their desire is and to give them that through Christ. Uh, you know, do you need healing? Do you need financial help? Do you want blessings financially? If you want those things, accept Christ, accept the gospel, and you'll have them. So, you know, we call this the prosperity gospel. And there's a lot of churches that are huge. They're mega churches. And, and especially the pastoral staff, they're rich <laughs> because they have so many people going to these churches. And it's all because they want financial blessings. So they say, you know, if, if you believe in Christ, if you pray hard enough, you're going to get the best parking spot there is when you go to the store. You're going to get, you know, all these financial blessings from work. You know, all these great things are going to happen to you if you simply believe. Um, and I met, I was in uh, India last year, and I met this man, and I was sharing the gospel with him. And it came down to the fact that he wouldn't accept Christ into his heart unless God granted him a child. So him and his wife, they desperately wanted a baby. They've been praying for it for a long time. They were Hindus, and they decided to try Christianity because they think they thought that, hey, if I believe in Christ, God's going to give me this baby. And so he wouldn't accept the gospel unless God was able to provide that for him, unless there's a guarantee behind it. You know, this is this is, you know, trying to appeal to the desire of man. Um, and the result is that Christianity has become just one of many other religions. If you believe in Christ, you get what you want. You know, you receive healing of your stress, your anxiety, of your problems. And just like any other religion might offer, you, know, you can have a better life if you follow these rules or these standards. Or can fulfill your desires. And it's all about your choice. America is really you know, focused on your choice. You, know, you go to the grocery store, you have so many choices of things. And it's very commercialized, and that's what spirituality has become. It has become something where you choose what fits you. Now, it's not up to God's standard. It's what fits you. 
You can choose a little bit of this, a little bit of that, mix it all together, and that's your religion. You know, that's what you follow. That's your God that you've made. Um, so now in America, we have this thing called pluralism that's sweeping America uh, that I mentioned before where, you know, each religion is okay as long as they're, they're, they're honest and sincere and really trying to seek out God, each path is equal in achieving salvation. I met a, a teacher in um, Thailand this past year, or this year actually, when I was there um, doing Kata missions. <clears throat> and I was talking to this, this young man, um, and you know he, he really loved Jesus. <laughs> he had a lot of passion for Jesus, and he actually had tattoos all of his body related, related to different scripture verses. He actually had a heart um, tattooed on him, but it wasn't like heart shape. It was like what, a, what an actual heart looks like. <laughs> and really, really graphic tattoos, and they were all related to scripture verses. And he really loved the Bible. He really loved Jesus. And he also thought that Jesus was the one way of salvation. And so I was like, okay, this guy's a Christian. It's great. But um, the more I talked to him, the more I started questioning things. As I was talking to him, I found out that you know, he really liked kind of a lot of the, the, the Hindu philosophy. He had a lot of you know, interest in it. And he had gotten to the point where he, he believed that, you know, he believes that Jesus is the way, Christ is the way. But that in Buddhism and Hinduism, there's a Christ as well. You know, there's a path that you follow, and if you, if you sincerely follow that path in Buddhism or Hinduism, that's you following Christ. It's just God put Christ in that religion. And so, you know, I was wondering what that is. It's, you know, they have a name for it. It's called um, anonymous Christianity or inclusivism because it, it, it's very inclusive, whereas you know, most Christians are exclusive. They think that only in Christianity that Jesus Christ is the only way. This wants to be inclusive, include everything. So it's called anonymous Christianity. And there was a theologian that came up with this. His name is Karl Donner, um, during the 20th century. And he believed that God is present in non-Christian religions to save the adherents through Christ. And it's based on two beliefs. The first is that salvation is through Christ alone. The second is that God wills the whole world to be saved. So this is his quote. He says this. Anonymous Christianity means that a person lives in the grace of God and attains salvation outside of explicitly constituted Christianity. Let us say, a Buddhist monk, who because he follows his conscience, attains salvation and lives in the grace of God, of him I must say that he is an anonymous Christian. If not, I would have to presuppose that there is a genuine path to salvation that really attains that goal but that simply has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. But I cannot do that. And so, if I hold that everyone, if I hold if everyone depends upon Jesus Christ for salvation, and if at the same time I hold that many live in the world who have not expressly recognized Jesus Christ, then there remains, in my opinion, nothing else but to take up the postulate of an anonymous Christianity. He cannot believe that there's a genuine path that attains the goal. He cannot believe that in Christianity it's the only way. You know, and this is what is really seeping into America. There's so many paths that you could take. You know, Christianity expands, you know, expands, you know, beyond the Christian framework. It, it enters into different religions. That's what they believe. Um, so I think part of the problem. That is a huge problem that we have in America. And another thing is that we think of the problem that we have as an illness, as a sickness. You know, and in the same way that when you get a cold, you know, you can try different things to try to help that cold out. You know, you can take medicine, you could rest a lot, and drink a lot of orange juice, take a hot shower, drink lots of tea, you know, take lots and lots of vitamin C, maybe sweat, <laughs> sweat it out. Um, you know, there's all these alternative medicines alternative things that you could try uh, to relieve stress, anxiety, spa centers, yoga, deep breathing. But here's the problem. The problem that we have, the spiritual problem that we have, is not that we're sick. It's that we're dead. 
spiritually. So none of these work. And that's what the world cannot see. You are dead. You are dead in your transgressions and sins. And there is but one solution, one unique solution. And you need the creator God to give it to you. That is Christ. The one way is Christ. It is unique to all religions and all alternatives. Today's passage that we read, it talks about this man. His name's Eutychus. <laughs> Eutychus, you know, he's listening to the messages all night, right? <laughs> and he falls out the window. And he's dead. He's not a little dead. <laughs> he's not injured. It says he is dead. Um, and someone like that, they need the power of God for them to come to life again. And a lot of times we use this analogy when we talk about our spiritual state. You know, our spiritual state is as if we jumped off a building, the fourth floor, and we died, and we hit the ground. We cannot call a doctor for help. We cannot seek medical attention. Even if someone gives us medicine, it won't help us if we are dead. None of those things can help us. That is our spiritual state. And so what I want to do today is I want to look at scripture regarding that spiritual state accurately. You know, looking at the accurate state of man born into sin. You know, the world says that we are sick, but the Bible says we're dead, we're in darkness, we're slaves. We're not even free to choose God. So let's look at the first point. The first thing is spiritually dead. Thinking about being dead is, do dead people choose to live? Can a dead person choose to come to life? It's impossible. In Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, it says, As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. We were dead in our sins. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following his desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So it says here in verse 3, by nature, you know, that's by birth. By birth, we were deserving of wrath. Now why is that? It's because God is just. God is a just God. And the penalty for sin is death. So justly, his wrath is against sin, his wrath is against us. We're not deserving grace, we're not deserving mercy in any way. We don't deserve those things. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it says, For as in Adam, all die. It doesn't say some die. All die. We've inherited this curse. We've inherited this sin. We've inherited death from Adam. All die. Colossians 2, 13 says, When you were dead in your sins, we were dead in our sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. We were dead in our sins. God has to make you alive. In the scriptures, it also talks about how we're slaves. We're slaves to sin. We're slaves to Satan. Now the question is, do slaves have a choice to be free? No, they don't. They're slaves. And John 8, 44 says, You belong to your father, the devil and you want to carry out your father's desire. So what are we prone to? We're prone to follow Satan, to follow his desires. We want to carry out those desires. In Romans 6, 6, it says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. We are slaves, again. Romans 6, 17, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, we're slaves. The scriptures always say we're slaves. 2 Timothy 2, 25-26 says, Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of truth. We need to be granted repentance from God. God gives us that. It continues in verse 26, And that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. So do we have free will? The scripture says we don't. It says we are captives to do his will. We are enslaved by him. 
It also says we're in the darkness. So, you know, we're spiritually dead, we're enslaved, we're in the darkness. Ephesians 5, 8, for you were once in darkness. Colossians 1, 13, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4 to 6, it says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel. They cannot see it. They're in the darkness. In verse 6, it says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. God, who said, Let light shine out of, out of darkness. Now, this is going back to Genesis, when God created all things. He said, let there be light. And this is what he says to us. who are spiritually dead and in darkness. He made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in Christ. It also says that we are in ignorance or alienated and hostile to God. Colossians 1.21 says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds, we are alienated. We are enemies of God. Romans 8, 7, and 8 says, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It's hostile towards God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It is impossible in that state, in that state to, to submit to God's law in any way. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So as sinners... No matter how good they think they're doing good, no matter how, many, how much charity they give, how many good works, it says they cannot please God in those things. You know, it's as if you're a pirate on a pirate ship. You know, a pirate, he's on the wrong side from the start. No matter how good he is or how well he does, he's still a pirate. And in fact, the more good that he does, it actually helps the enemy more. It helps being a pirate the better he is at it. That's our state, in that state of spiritual death and slavery and darkness. But the blessing that we have received is that we are called into the light of Christ. In 1 Peter 2.9 it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Amen. We are called out of this earth and we are chosen by God. Mark 3.13 says, Jesus went up to the mountainside and called to him those he wanted and they came to him. He has called us to be with us. In Luke 5.27-28, Jesus goes and he calls the tax collector Levi as he's sitting at his tax booth. He says, follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything and followed. You know, this is all Jesus says. He walks by and says, follow me. And Levi, Matthew, the tax collector, he leaves everything. And immediately, he follows Christ. I think the key verse is this, John 15, 16. For people think that it's all about us choosing God, choosing salvation, choosing Christ. This verse is pretty clear. John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. You did not choose me, it says. I chose you. And he makes us alive in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. In Christ we are made alive. Ephesians 2, 5 says, he has made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And this is key. Grace. This is why we're saved. It's God showing us grace. He makes us alive in Christ, even though we're dead. Even though we can't call out to God, even though we can't choose God, He chooses us and makes us alive. That is grace that we've been shown. I think that the, the best 
um, story or analogy that really makes this, this clear for me is the story of Lazarus. Um, if you know about Lazarus, um, you know, while Jesus is away doing ministry, Lazarus dies. And he's put in a tomb, he's buried. And it's a few days, it's actually four days before Jesus is able to make it there. And so all of his family, everyone's weeping. Um, it says even Jesus wept at the time. And Jesus, and Lazarus has been dead four days, sitting in the tomb, and Jesus goes, and he calls him. He calls him, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus arises from the dead, and he walks out of the tomb. Now, is there anything in Lazarus that would allow him to respond to Christ? Can he hear that voice? You know, is his, is his, are his muscles working where he can actually audibly hear this voice? No. There's nothing that would allow him to hear Christ. He is made alive. And when Jesus calls him, it's not something that he can deny either. He's not going to say, Oh, Jesus, I'm just going to stay dead, sorry. I know you called me out of the tomb. I know you called me to have life, but I'm just going to rest. I'm just going to stay here. No, he can't deny that. He can't deny that call. He immediately arises from the dead and comes out. It's clear. John 8, 12, it says that, Then Jesus spoke again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We mentioned this verse earlier, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. God said, Let light shine out of darkness. He made his light shine in our hearts. He made his light shine in our hearts. He created it in our hearts. He resurrected it in our hearts. In Ephesians 5 8, it says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Live as children of light. He doesn't say you will be the light, he says, You are the light. Mark 5 14 and 15 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light shine before others. We are the light of the world because we have Christ. We've been chosen <laughs> by God, made alive to be the light. And you know, one, one of the things that gives us this charge for our light, almost like a battery, is God's word. In Psalms 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, the Word of God, it works in connection with our spirit. It charges it that we may shine brighter. The third point is that we are spiritually reborn. In John 1, 12-13, Jesus says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What's important is verse 13. It says, Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. This is not based on human decision at all. This is based on God and his choice. In John 3, 8, it says, Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from, or where it is going. So we'll be with everyone born of the Spirit. It says the wind blows where it pleases. And the Holy Spirit, it blows where it pleases. You know, it is God's choice of salvation. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only by the Spirit. We cannot know God without God's Spirit. Now you can read this Bible a million times and it won't make sense to you if you do not have God's Spirit in you. You cannot see the key of Christ without God's Spirit. You cannot have salvation without being born again. It says in John 5, 21, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives life, gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. The Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. John 6, 44, no one, come to, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. 
So God the Father draws those to Christ. John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you will indeed be free. We're set free from, from that spiritual slavery that bondage is Satan. So all three work in the Trinity. I think we can see how it all works for our salvation in 2 Thessalonians, Thess no, sorry. <laughs> Second Thessalonians 2, 13, and 14. Thessalonica, yeah, the church of Thessalonica. In verse 13 it says, but we are always, a, sorry, but we always, ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. He says, because God chose you as first fruits. So God chose us. God chose us as first fruits to be saved, how? Through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Chosen by God, sanctified by the work of the Spirit, and through your belief in the truth. This truth is the truth of Christ. He has called you to this through the gospel, that you might share in the glory of of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Trinity is at work in our work of salvation. And through the gospel, ultimately, of Christ. So in conclusion, you know, it, is, it is so important to understand our spiritual state accurately. And there's reasons. To clearly see that we are spiritually dead and God shows us this grace. Because ultimately, with this view, the glory of salvation is all God's. He receives all the praise, all the glory of salvation, of people's lives changing. Because it's his work. Because it's not man's choice. It's not through man's effort. And it doesn't even give pride to evangelists. Why? Because they are simply following God. And it is God working through them. It's a very humbling experience. It is all God's work, and thus, it is to him alone that receives the glory. If it was man's choice, like a lot of churches proclaim today, then man has some pride that he could have. He chose God. He chose to do the right thing. It's through his effort, through his decision. But if we're in a state of spiritual death, like the scriptures say, and God chooses us, it's all to God's glory and not ours alone. Also, if that is true, then there should be less trials and confusion because we're not promising a better life now. You know, it's not about you receiving all these financial blessings in this life and, and receiving all these great things. You know, the truth is, our hope is in heaven. We're going to go through difficulties. We're going to go through trials, hardships. We're not always going to have, you know, the best things in life. We're going to run through financial difficulties. And that's okay. Because Jesus says, I have overcome the world. You know, we are spiritually alive in Christ. Our names are written in the book of heaven. Every day we can rejoice because of that. No matter what we have, no matter what situation, we can rejoice in that every day. And that also gives us assurance. And if it was our choice and about our efforts, we would sway at times. We run into a difficulty or sin a little bit, and I wonder, oh, am I going to go to heaven? Am I going to go to hell? You know, tomorrow, you know, what's going to happen? You know, do I have to see a priest and confess my sins right now after I had this thought of something? You know, you should have assurance and confidence and walk confidently in faith. If you're saved, knowing that God chose you from the beginning of time, He's not going to change His mind. And the thirdly is that the answer is unique and clear. If you know the accurate problem, you know that there's one solution. It's not a sickness or a weakness that we have to be cured through effort, through meditation, through different methods. You need to be born again. And that is through Christ and Christ alone. Because he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And when it comes to the Father, except through me. We're not inclusive Christianity. There's no anonymous Christianity. It is exclusive. There is one way, and one way only. Um, you know, the, lastly, there's, only, there's kind of a question that might come up regarding this. You know, if it is really God's work, then why do we evangelize? <laughs> you know, why do I need to go outside and share the gospel with someone? Why do I need to share the gospel with my friend, or my relative, or my coworker? It is really all in the hands of God, sovereign God. Um, the answer 
And this thing got demanded. <laughs> you know, Matthew 28. God says, you know, Jesus says, make disciples of all nations. And that's one reason. But I think the other reason is because ultimately God wants to bless us through it. You know, this is God's work. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to be with you. So what he does is he allows us to take part in that work so that we can work with him, so we can always be with him in something that gives him the greatest joy, which is people being saved, people becoming his children. So it's our blessing to do this work of evangelism with him. And that's why I think that he calls us to do it. We might not understand the reason, ultimately. I mean, God's ways are higher than our ways. We don't understand everything. But ultimately, I think it is that God wants to be with us in his greatest work. You know, in the face of the churches that are really changing to fit culture, to fit society, I think it's important that we don't sacrifice the truth of God's word, that we don't dilute the gospel in any way. You know, there might be many people that come to acceptance if you change the gospel, if you, you know, leave something out, or if you're more accepting. There might be a lot of people that are accepted. But what message are they accepting? What are they believing in? That is important. We need to hold on to the promise and the truth of God's word. The point of today's message is that for us, going from death to life, it is 100% by God's grace. And knowing and understanding what that means is an extremely humbling experience, if you really think about it. It destroys any pride that you may have. So rejoice, because you are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Rejoice in Christ Jesus. Let's pray at this time. Um, as our